Hello again. We are so used to depending upon fossil fuels such as oil, gas and coal that abandoning their use seems like a radical idea. In fact, the movement to achieve this end was going strong 150 years ago now and very nearly revolutionised electricity production in the time of our great-great-grandparents. The thumbnail to this video shows a solar power plant. The juxtaposition of the parabolic reflector, which looks a little like some sort of death ray, and the people wearing top hats and ankle-length dresses is disconcerting. This is not a modern-day drawing, though, from a graphic novel. It's an engraving of a scene at the Paris Exposition in 1878, when Auguste Richard set up a solar power plant and used it used it to make, of all unlikely things, ice cubes. It is today regarded as axiomatic in the Western world that Europe and America must reduce their dependence on fossil fuels of all kinds. The routine use of oil, coal and natural gas must become a thing of the past. There are two chief reasons for this desire to free ourselves from the need to extract carbon-rich fuels from the earth. One, of course, is that their use contributes to climate change. The other is that fossil fuels are in limited supply, and when they're gone, they're gone. Perhaps not this year, maybe not even this century. The oil that we use for our cars will run out, and we will have mined or obtained by fracking all the remaining coal and gas. If we have not by that time found alternative ways to generate electricity, then there is the prospect of our civilization entering a new dark age, with industrialization coming to an abrupt halt. This is a chilling scenario, one which would have been very familiar to the Victorians. On Thursday, the 1st of September, 1881, the famous scientist Sir William Thompson, later to become Lord Kelvin, after whom, of course, the Kelvin Temperature Scale is named, gave a speech in Edinburgh to the British Association for the Advancement of Science. His tone was sombre, and Lord Kelvin urged others to share his anxiety about what he saw as a looming crisis. The title of the paper he delivered that day was On the Sources of Energy in Nature Available to Man for the Production of Mechanical Effort. He wanted his listeners that day to understand one very important point that their entire civilization was founded upon the burning of fossil fuels, and that when those fuels ran out, they were likely to be in terrible trouble. It was coal which had fueled the Industrial Revolution, and it was still powering British society at that time, the time that that talk was delivered. It was burned to power the railway trains which spanned Britain. It enabled ships to cross the ocean. It was vital for the production of steel and was used in the generation of electricity. Lord Kelvin, though, feared that it was running out. In Europe, other scientists had been making the same point for years. It was essential to develop sources of renewable energy, solar, hydroelectric and tidal power, for instance. We sometimes forget that Britain led the way in this kind of thing back in Victoria's time. Such views were taken seriously because in that same year, the world's first public supply of electricity began, which provided both street lighting and power to ordinary homes. Instead of being produced by burning fossil fuels, the electricity was generated by environmentally friendly means. The quiet English town of Godalming might seem an odd place to find the world's first provision of a public electricity supply, available both for lighting the streets and for domestic use. One would perhaps have expected to hear of such an exciting scheme first being instituted in New York or London, rather than backwater like God old Mean in Surrey. Nevertheless, on Saturday the 1st of October 1881, the edition of the local newspaper, the Surrey Advertiser, carried the following story. On Monday evening, 26th of September, the upper portion of the borough of Godalming was lighted by electricity for a few hours as an experiment, 
and continued each night since, the motive power to generate the current being an auxiliary face water wheel at the Westbrook Mills of Messrs. Foreman Brothers, the skin dressers who have made arrangements for lighting their mills with the swan lights and for the larger open spaces with Siemens differential lamps of 800 candle power each. This article is chiefly concerned with the public exploitation of the new electrical supply, but it was also available to ordinary houses as well if the owners could afford to pay for it. Electric lighting worked out a little more expensive at that time than gas. It was at this point touch and go whether or not hydroelectric power and solar energy were to become the great thing of the future, or if the world would insist upon reliance upon coal. As many scientists were pointing out, mining coal in order to burn it, thus heating water and producing steam to run a steam engine which would turn a dynamo, was a very roundabout and inefficient way of achieving things. It made far more sense simply to harness the power of rivers and tides to turn the dynamos directly, without using up any coal at all. This tied in neatly with fears about the depletion of coal stocks and the anxiety that they might soon be exhausted. The world was on the cusp of a clean energy revolution, one which would not rely upon fossil fuels. Not everybody could see the great opportunity which presented itself with the successful exploitation of hydroelectric power, though. For many people, steam was modern. It was the driving force of the Industrial Revolution and the obvious choice when setting up a power station. There was, it was felt by some pioneers in the field, something a little backward-looking and old-fashioned about the idea of using water wheels to make electricity. Steam engines were modern. They were cheap. There was plenty of coal. Why not exploit it to the full? Three and a half months after the world's first supply of public and domestic electricity came online in Surrey, another power station opened in the heart of London at Hoban Viaduct. This was built by the Edison Electric Light Company and turned out 93 kilowatts of direct current electricity at 110 volts. It was driven by a coal-fired steam turbine. Thomas Edison was perhaps the most influential figure in electrical engineering at that time, and if he had plumped for steam turbines to turn his dynamos, then that was good enough for everybody else. From that day to this, the burning of fossil fuels to make steam to turn turbines has always been the most popular way of producing electricity, not only in this country, but throughout the entire world. Hydroelectric power became a minor and insignificant player in the field. Just as clean hydroelectric power stations almost became the standard, so too did solar energy enjoy a brief vogue at roughly the same time. There are two ways of using the energy of the sun to perform work. One is by harnessing the sun's rays and using their heat to perform work. The other is to convert the light directly into electricity by the use of photovoltaic cells. Both have their roots on, in the 19th century. Glass-covered boxes which are painted black can heat up very rapidly when the sun shines on them. These are often to be seen on roofs in uh, Mediterranean countries where they provide hot water. Such an arrangement can also be used to cook food, as astronomer Sir John Herschel found out when he visited South Africa in 1834. By that time, the technology of solar cooking was well known. Once again, it was fears about the wisdom of relying upon fossil fuels which spurred on the development of alternative sources of energy. Just as with hydroelectric power, there came a point at which the whole idea so very nearly took off before short-sighted political and economic considerations intervened and stifled common sense. In 19th century France, some people were voicing the same fears as Lord Kelvin in England, that supplies of coal would run out and the Industrial Revolution grind to a halt. It was a terrifying prospect, and since the price of coal in France was, for various reasons, rising at that time, the search began for other ways of obtaining energy. Augustine Michaud was a French mathematician and teacher who was born in 1825. He was also an inventor and from 1860 devoted his efforts to finding alternative energy sources, 
and so free his country from reliance upon coal, much of which was being imported from abroad. To begin with, Mouchot experimented with soda cooking and found that it was perfectly possible to cook a meal without burning any wood or coal, but simply by enclosing a black container in glass. The greenhouse effect did the rest. This was interesting, but hardly new. His next experiment, though, was certainly exciting and novel. Mouchot managed to operate a small steam engine in the same way by solar power alone. He did this by concentrating the sun's rays by a parabolic mirror. One of his larger mirrors of this sort can be seen in the thumbnail to this video. The Emperor of France, Napoleon III, was very interested in this work, seeing the economic benefits if France's use of coal could somehow be reduced. In 1869, Augustine Michaud set out his theories about solar energy in a book called Industrial Applications of Solar Energy. The Franco-Prussian War, which began the following year, disrupted his work, but by the following year he had gained permission to install a solar generator at the library in Tours. A few years later he was given leave of absence from his teaching post so that he could construct his biggest solar-powered engine yet for the Universal Exhibition in 1878. It's this which we can see in the thumbnail. The engine, powered only by focused sunlight, ran a small refrigeration plant, which, to the amazement and delight of visitors to the exhibition, produced a steady supply of ice cubes. Before the Universal Exhibition in Paris, though, Michaud had been given facilities to travel to Algeria, then a French colony, where the almost constant supply of bright and uninterrupted sunshine made it an ideal place to conduct experiments in solar energy. Michaud set up desalination plants in Algeria which turned seawater into drinking water. The French government, with the approval of Napoleon III, had up until this time been financing Michaud's work. It was thought that if solar energy could help to reduce France's reliance on imported coal, then it was well worth encouraging. As is so often the case with governments, though, the only real interest lay in short-term advantage rather than any vision of a future world which might be improved. As soon as the immediate need for such research disappeared, the funding was likely to be axed at once. On the 23rd of January 1860, Britain and France signed what had been described as the world's first modern trade agreement. The Cobden Chevalier Treaty was a free trade agreement which removed or reduced tariffs and duties on goods traded between Britain and France. Because coke and coal were specifically included in the Cobden Chevalier Treaty, this had the effect of gradually bringing down the price of coal in France. Combined with improvements in transport, which allowed coal to be moved about the country more easily, the French government decided at the end of 1878 that they no longer needed to worry their heads about alternative energy. All funding was cut for projects such as Michaud's and France's brief flirtation with solar power came to an abrupt end. There was great enthusiasm for renewable green energy in the United States at this time as well. In December 1884, an American magazine carried something likely to excite readers of the time greatly, an extract from Mark Twain's latest book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Also in th that same edition of Century magazine was an article by Samuel Pierpoint Langley of the Smithsonian about solar energy. Langley was a very well-known scientist at that time, but like many in the scientific world, he was concerned about the consequences for the world of running out of fossil fuels. He also wanted to draw attention to the fact that burning fossil fuels was, even when they were plentiful, likely to pollute the atmosphere as waste heat, all of which has a decidedly modern flavour about it. Since the fossil fuels ultimately contained energy which had been absorbed from the sun's rays, why not skip a stage in the process and utilise the rays directly? Langley proposed that arrays of parabolic reflectors with Stirling engines attached could be set up in the Sahara Desert, where they would provide literally limitless free energy, 
which would allow the desert to be irrigated and colonised. <coughs> Stirling engines are carbon neutral motors which work just on heat. It's a pity that this first green energy revolution petered out because we are currently tentatively exploring technologies which were already very sophisticated in the 1880s. Who knows how the world might have developed if the momentum had been maintained in those days?